I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Tamsin Webster. I eventually got to a point, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> the things that we're doing, like that are supposedly the things that are going to work to create change, to differentiate, to, to really make meaning for people in their lives. I'm like, that's completely opposite. What I, I personally experienced to be true, but also what the research says to be true. Part message designer, part English to English translator, Tamsin Webster helps leaders craft their case for large-scale change. In addition to her work in and for major organizations such as Harvard Medical School, Fidelity Investments, and Clavio, she's a judge and mentor for the Harvard Innovation Labs, a professional advisor at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, and has spent over 10 years as the idea strategist for one of the only nine legacy-level TEDx events in the world. She was named to the Thinker's 50 Radar in 20. 22, and is the author of two books, Find Your Red Thread and Say What They Can't Unhear, The Nine Principles of Lasting Change. She lives in Boston with her husband, two sons, and two brindle greyhounds, Hazel and Walnut. My interview with Tamsin Webster is coming right up, but first. My dad works in B2B marketing, but I never really knew what that meant. Then one day, my dad came by my school for career day and told everyone in my class he was a big ROAS man. Then he just kept saying things like, the bigger the ROAS, the better, over and over. My friends still laugh at me to this day. I think it means calculating a return on ad spend. One thing's for sure. I'll be known as the ROAS man's kid for the rest of my days. Why couldn't you just be a fireman or a lawyer? Why? You ruined my life, Dad. Not everyone gets B2B, but LinkedIn has the people who do. And with ads on LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people based on job title, industry, likelihood to buy, and more. Start converting your B2B audience into high-quality leads today. We'll even give you a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash mpn. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be to be. Hi, I'm Jason Falls, the executive producer of the Marketing Podcast Network. As you probably know, Asheville and Western North Carolina were nearly destroyed by Hurricane Helene in late September. The Red Cross has deemed this a Category 7 disaster, which is the largest category they give. One of our member podcasters, Patrick Casale, is on the front lines there. He's an Asheville native who is living through and witnessing the trauma, destruction, and recovery his family, friends, and fellow community members are going through. Patrick started a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for relief efforts. All donations through Patrick's fundraiser go to local nonprofits who are helping with supply runs. Donations there directly impact people in need. I've given to the fund personally. Patrick has given as well, despite the fact he's having to recover too. The Marketing Podcast Network wants to help, and we know you do too. Visit Patrick's campaign at bit.ly slash WNC help. The abbreviation is for Western North Carolina WNC. Bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash WNC help. Any amount goes a long way. Even just $5 can provide a few gallons of clean drinking water to a family in need. Please join us in helping the relief and recovery efforts in Asheville and Western North Carolina. Go to bit.ly slash WNC help today and contribute. That's bit.ly slash WNC help. The full URL B-I-T dot L-Y slash WNC help. Donate what you can. Every dollar helps. Tamsin Webster, welcome to On Brand. Oh, Nick, I'm excited. I, I may probably just terrified your audience with that enthusiastic response, but hello. I am, in fact, very glad to be here. You know, terrified, woke up. We'll we'll take what we we'll can ter- get here <laughs> at the two. On Brand Podcast. Yeah, I should have I should have answered in like the sedate Nick Westergaard way. Hello, Nick. Well, it's hello. Good to see. Hello. I, you know, I, I, at, you know, it's bet you talk about the 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 voice. It's like I, I do my best to just be like a light Midwestern Tom Webster. So <laughs> that's if I if I can if I can if I can get to that, 
we're we're good. That's good. Yeah, I um, <laughs> well, I appreciate that because I re- just finished recording my audiobook for the new book, and one of my audiobook reviewers, I sent it out to three friends of mine, is <laughs> is a Midwesterner, and she compl- complimented me on my diction. She's like, as a Midwesterner, I have to compliment you on your diction, and I'm like, well, thanks. Well, you know, it's probably go. best that I didn't do it in the form of my Bostonian alter ego, Karen O'Sullivan. Um, um, it may have been a little bit more colorful that way, shall we say? But oh, yeah. I love it. That's I, I. I would love to do a whole show with Karen, with yeah, the she's... with with the Karen alter ego. But <laughs> I missed an opportunity to say uh, welcome back, uh, well, and we just you. had Tom on a, a few months back, also. But you two were among the first guests, but you specifically were like guest number two or three. Oh, was I really? Look you were. And I don't think you've been back since 500 plus oh, episodes later. What did I do, Nick? I, I'm glad I'm back in your good graces. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> happy to be, happy to be chatting again. Fabulous. So I, I want to kick things off because uh, your latest book really builds on your work uh, of of find your red threads so uh, kind of catch us up with like the uh, I love the uh, the shows with like previously on so <laughs> how does this yes the recap. pick up and continue your work yeah absolutely so find your red thread was born out of this question how can I make any idea not just understandable but irresistible and so I started with well what do our brains find understandable and irresistible kind of across humans because you know as a as a lifelong marketer and usually a lifelong resource constrained marketer, I was always interested in what could I do once, right? Like what's going to be the best use of resources? And it doesn't take long before I, you know, you find as many people have done that story is the way that we make sense of the world. And it's an extraordinarily powerful way to make something both understand, you know, understandable and interesting to people. So find your red thread was very much about how do you break you know, a, what are the common elements of story, no matter the form, meaning it doesn't just have to be a hero's journey, but what are just, what do, what are the elements that every story has and particularly every story of transformation has? And then how do you take an idea and reverse engineer it back into those elements so that when you use those elements in that order to explain your idea, it makes more sense. You reduce information and transfer loss, and it's going to have built-in interest because there's a natural up and down with story, as you know very, very well. And then I noticed something. What I noticed was is that even the most beautifully architected stories, story structure, et cetera, didn't always work to achieve the change that they were designed to create or to instigate. And so I got very curious about that. I was like, well, what, what is that? Like, what, what, what are we, what are we missing about story? If story is like the thing, what about the thing isn't working when it doesn't work? And for whatever reason, that old storytelling maxim that a story is an argument got stuck in my head. And I started to think, well, what if that is actually true? What if it is, in fact, an argument for, a ba- I mean, it, I mean, it is, you know, any story really is an argument for a particular course of action. Fables you know, are a great example because they tell you what the course of action is in the, in the moral. Um, but really any idea is. And then I was like, well, what are the arguments we agree with? What, what determines that? Well, we, you know, if it works, we agree with the argument. So what's the argument based on? And I was like, oh my gosh, it's based on beliefs. It's based on principles. So the stories we agree with, the arguments we agree with, the changes that we agree to are based on a story we can tell ourselves that's based on beliefs we already have. And so in other words, there's a layer underneath story and if we're really looking to truly understand how people change, how to use language and messaging to help create the conditions for that change, then it's really under, then it's really important that we understand this whole universe of ideas that have to come together. And so I decided to put that out there, not so much as the how-to on how to build that 
core case, which is the precursor to a red thread. Uh, let's let's call that the next book. Um, but I realized <laughs> that that these principles that were out there about what truly drives change just weren't in or a part of conventional wisdom. So I wanted to write a book that took all of that and put it out into the universe. I, I love that. And it occurs to me as you talk about red thread and story, uh, just to kind of uh, sidestep in parallel to all of this, your brand being so well built, your personal brand being so well built. And it is kind of pun intended, tied up <laughs> in the in the story of the red thread. But for yes. those that don't know, can you give us that that backstory? Because I think sure. that's <laughs> such a such a neat fit. Yeah. So um so the red thread is the name that I appended to this idea of a story structure that is, you know, that helps you build a story that people can tell themselves. Uh, and it starts with the idea that it's essentially reconstructing this story that you told yourself about a particular idea. Um, and so by reconstructing that story, we can help people follow the same path, that same rationale, that same kind of intuitive, emotional path to that new idea. And as you may remember, the, 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 the process for that, the story structure I had come up with predated the, the name, the red thread. Um, but so, but separately else in my kind of <laughs> storehouse of potentially useful information that is my brain, um, was this, um, Swedish Northern European idiom of the red thread. And now just quick before anybody goes, well, it's not just a Northern European. I, I know. But the way that I first interacted with it was in the Northern European sense of the red thread, where they talk about it as the thing that makes things make sense, right? The through line, the logical progression of ideas through something. Um, and I was curious separately about the idiom and where that version of the idiom, people thought that it, where its roots lay, um, because there's, there are red threads in other cultures, particularly Eastern cultures, uh, and religions and philosophies, and they have a different source and they mean something slightly different. But the, this one, uh, turns out to be based in Greek mythology and specifically the legend of Theseus and the Minotaur and Ariadne's red thread. Uh, some debate as to the color of the thread, but over time it has been come to known as, as the red thread. So the red thread is what Ariadne gave to Theseus to help him trace the path through this lab, uh, labyrinth, the maze in which the Minotaur lived, so that he could, once he defeated the Minotaur, retrace his steps and find his way back out. And once I found that story, my brain was like, oh, this, huh, this is like this, this, the story, the name describes not only the output of this process that I had developed. In other words, it will produce a logical progression of ideas. It will produce, you know, the through line of something, the things that make it make sense. But the, the process of it was very much the same way where I, you know, when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, or if you read the book and you follow the process, it is about reconstructing in your own mind the conditions that gave rise to the idea in the first place so that you can do that in somebody else's mind as well. So that is the story of the red thread. Uh, I, you know, it's still very meaningful to me. I still believe very strongly that, that a core story, which is really what the red thread represents from a business standpoint is very necessary, uh, to help make whatever you're talking about, whatever you're marketing, whatever you're branding, um, as understandable as possible to people, um, while also in incorporating that very natural engagement and interest that comes from you know, the emotional switches that, that are built into stories from the beginning. On Brand, we'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Jason Falls, the executive producer of the Marketing Podcast Network. As you probably know, Asheville and Western North Carolina were nearly destroyed by Hurricane Helene in late September. The Red Cross has deemed this a Category 7 disaster, which is the largest category they give. 
One of our member podcasters, Patrick Casale, is on the front lines there. He's an Asheville native who is living through and witnessing the trauma, destruction, and recovery his family, friends, and fellow community members are going through. Patrick started a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for relief efforts. All donations through Patrick's fundraiser go to local nonprofits who are helping with supply runs. Donations there directly impact people in need. I've given to the fund personally. Patrick has given as well, despite the fact he's having to recover too. The Marketing Podcast Network wants to help, and we know you do too. Visit Patrick's campaign at bit.ly slash WNC help. The abbreviation is for Western North Carolina WNC. Bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash W-N-C help. Any amount goes a long way. Even just $5 can provide a few gallons of clean drinking water to a family in need. Please join us in helping the relief and recovery efforts in Asheville and Western North Carolina. Go to bit.ly slash WNC help today and contribute. That's bit.ly slash WNC help. The full URL, B-I-T dot L-Y slash WNC help. Donate what you can. Every dollar helps. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Hennica Watkins Porter hosts the Entrepreneurial You, empowering entrepreneurs with insights on leadership, business, and success. Hennica, tell listeners what to expect from your show. So we provide innovative business strategies and practical solutions to common entrepreneurial challenges. And where can people subscribe? Find us at HennicaWatkinsPorter.com, as well as the Marketing Podcast Network at Marketing podcast.net or search for it wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. Now back to the show. All right. So I am going to try to uh, a- adopt a-, a a Boston character of my oh, own. No. <laughs> so <laughs> so this this is this is maybe uh, maybe maybe Danny Fitzpatrick, <laughs> and and I'm in an elevator with yeah. you, and yeah. I'm saying, okay, so nine principles of lasting change. Yeah. What are they? Well, they are what you need to know about. I, I people. could either ask I could either ask Karen <laughs> yeah, or, exactly. or 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 Tamson. Yeah. So uh, Tamson will answer because Karen is like, <laughs> what the hell? Um, so uh, the the nine principles of everlasting change are essentially the distillations of my fascination with the intersection between truly long lasting change that started when I was seventeen. Yes. And communications, which has really been part of my interest area since I was 19. Uh, And it's really what the things that I have found about where those two intersect that have consistently led to better outcomes. Um, and they, they roughly fall into three groups in, in the, in the book. Uh, the first is kind of the things that you just generally need to know about how people process and on what basis do they make a decision to change. Uh, the second group is really about um, what the main pitfalls are when it comes to change communications. Uh, those tend to be the three that are the most um, convention defying as I'm finding by, as I'm talking to people uh, because they really represent the, the where, communication for change, by which I mean sustained action, is different, fundamentally different than communication to simply drive action one time, get a quick yes, you know, get somebody you know, engaged real quick and whatever. Um, these will work for that too, by the way. Um, and even better, people will keep doing the change. And then really the last three fall into the category of what I've learned about the the role and the the things that I need to keep in mind as a change communicator um, to in, to kind of keep the guardrails on what I can't can and can't do and really what should be my north stars as I'm thinking about um, what's going to be successful both for me and for them. So I'm happy to tell you exactly what they are, but I I mean I'm not trying to keep it a secret, but um, yeah, it helps to kind of understand the, the the larger framework into which they fall. Yeah. So in Talking about the principles, uh, and I was fascinated to hear you say your 
uh, almost like lifelong interest in lasting change. Mm. I wonder if you'd say more about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I will, I will date my interest in lasting change back to my, <laughs> you know, quite personal experience. Uh, the first time I experienced a debilitating panic attack was when I was seventeen. And, you know, landed me in the emergency room trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, it it turns out I was just a super anxious kid. Um, uh, Hopped up on prednisone and all sorts of other stuff because I was sick and I was supposed to be starring in the, well, not starring. I was a co-star of our, like, winter musical at high school. Um, But if you're familiar with anxiety and panic or you know anyone who is, then once you've experienced one of those things, you, you spend pretty much it's it's fair to say a, a little bit of every waking moment trying to keep it from happening again mm-hmm. and so you know and i and i spent a good you know of the 15 following years really just living with the with the idea that this had to be something i had to live with um though i secretly harbored a hope that that i didn't and then um kind of 17 years after my first first panic attack at 17 it just happens to work out that way um I had my last one, uh, and it was very much the product of of someone just even opening the possibility that I could live without it, not just managing it, like literally without the underlying um, feelings of panic and all of those things that that, that led to it. And you know, it, it intersects in a lot of ways with with what I talk about from kind of a broader principle basis. But you know, one of the things that really helped me personally with overcoming panic, um, was really coming to understand that, that, that panic, uh, particularly, you know, my version of it was a thought driven thing. Um, even if it started as a physical sensation or something like that, that what would create the, the wave of panic that would produce an attack was, was what, how, how I thought about it. And so I don't know if somebody said it to me or I just said it to myself, but one of the things that came into my mind was something that I literally couldn't unhear once I said it to myself or once I heard it. I don't, again, I don't remember where it came from, but it was this idea that if I, well, if this is thoughts and I thought my way in, I should be able to think my way out, right? Like I should be able to intersect those thoughts, you know, and kind of just piece by piece undo the thinking that got me into this in the first place and then start to figure that out. And that really was for me, not saying that's a universal solution for everybody, um, started what getting, what, what started to connect the dots and, and end my panic attacks for good. Um, and that was 17 years ago. So it is right now this year, kind of this, this kind of, freakish 17, 17, 17, like 17 without it, 17 with, 17 without. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't lost on me that it was a phrase, like it was a concept, an articulated concept, a a, a thing, you know, uh, to quote the translated Aristotle, kind of a realization of the true nature of my circumstances, my own personal anagnorisis to be super fancy. Um moment of truth, epiphany, whatever it was, that it was this intersection of, of language and something that I heard and couldn't unhear that really led to this permanent shift in uh, how I thought about, in this case, how I thought. That is fascinating because I, I think it's a, a really cool example of one's personal story really intersecting with what is your professional story. And you Mm. talked earlier about different layers of story. And uh, it's so often that one that drives us personally, there's a layer of that for those that have found a connection with meaningful work mm. that you can really see that overlay and and fit there. So I, I think that your journey in in both addressing that, finding that, and then building on that is 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 really something pretty powerful as we kind of look at the at the lives that we lead. Well, thank you. I mean, it, 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 and and I would say it. it it helped me understand and see that a lot of, 
you know, it, this was a lot of, you know, cognitive dissonance that I, I was experiencing because once I was able to start to see what was necessary to create transformational change at an individual level, I mean, my day job during all of this was you know, marketing, branding, uh, you know, ahead of di digital and content strategy and agencies and things like that. And it eventually got to a point, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Like, the things that we're doing, like that are supposedly the things that are going to work to 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 create change, to differentiate, to to really make meaning for people in their lives. I'm like, that's completely opposite what what I, I've personally experienced to be true, but also what the research says to be true when it comes to what creates change that lasts, what creates action that's sustainable. And so I started to take these lessons, not just from panic, because that was the one that, that took me the longest to, to undo. But you know, as I mentioned in the intro to the book, I mean, the other thing that I the other big transformational change that I made for myself that that got mapped into my professional work was you know, losing 50 pounds 25 years ago and maintaining that loss now uh, for that amount of time. And then I went on to Moonlight for 13 years to help other people do the same thing. And so again, I like there's such cognitive dissonance between what would work in a meeting room to help people have these, again, permanent think, you know, shifts in thinking or behavior about something that is typically quite difficult and very personal, that were absolutely at odds with what the conventional wisdom was saying was, quote unquote, the right way to persuade, to influence, to market, to sell. You know, and, and the big one at the core of that, which, which you know, I, I make, I make I pull no punches about, was is leveraging pain. Um, because even if, you know, let's just take it back to, to that. <laughs> yeah, and you know what I mean, where people are like, you've got to make the pain of status quo, exceed the pain of change and like yeah. dial it up, dial it up, raise the stakes, raise the stakes. I was like, all right. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, speaking as someone who has very intimate relationship with fear and panic, I'm like, let me just, let's just, yeah, let's just calm down for a minute and like have a conversation about this. Because even if you take it to the aspect of like, if anyone's ever been in therapy, tell me what therapist would start that process with everything you're doing is wrong. If you don't fix this, it's all going to be worse. Like, and, and like you, you laugh and everyone I ever say that to laughs and I'm like, we're, it's no different. Like we're trying to get people to do something different and we are starting in absolutely the wrong place a lot of times that will help them do that. And when you take it and put it into a different context, you start to see how bass backwards it actually is, you know? <laughs> um, so this book was really driven, I mean, by you know, a fairly large fire in my belly about getting a different perspective out there. Um, but again, not just my opinion, this was the perspective of things that we know from all of these other areas of research and practice, um, psychology, neuroscience, behavioral economics, um, adult learning, all of these other places have figured out what actually is necessary for long-term and transformational change. And we're just not doing it when it comes to marketing, sales, leadership, communication, managerial communications, et cetera. And so, you know, I think this is probably about as close to a manifesto <laughs> as I'll ever write. It's my Tamifesto. Um, but <laughs> I, I just, I just, I mean, you can tell, I feel very strongly that there is another way to create the change that I would argue we very desperately need at all sorts of levels, um, you know, not just organizational, but market, societal, planetary. Um, and, you know, a lot of the issues that I see when people are struggling, I look at them and I'm like, these, these, these are solvable problems. These are, these are answerable questions. And in fact, not just one other area of practice, but multiple other areas have already figured out these answers. So, all right, then I, let me take the you know the work that I've done everywhere else in my life. You 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 called out the English to English translation, <laughs> and I said, well, let me just translate these other concepts from these other places into language situations, frameworks, concepts that you know based on my ex you know twenty five years of experience with business, organizational communications, organizational behavior, leadership, et cetera terms and concepts that those folks will, will resonate with them. 
Um, and so that's what I've tried to do. I love that. And I love the callback to English to English translation as well. <laughs> well, your answers have made me smile many times during our conversation. And now it is my turn to get to ask you okay. uh, for a brand that has mm. made you smile recently. All right. So the brand that has made me smile recently, I would say I was thinking about this because I was like, do I go with one of my, my own? Like, <laughs> like any, my, like my, I mean, I'm, I'm very much known to be a just deep, deep devotee of Diane von Furstenberg, the woman, the brand, the legend. Um, but I would say, I would say more specifically a brand that, that, that I've been enjoying a lot lately. Um, uh, just to put a nice counterpoint to, you know, the seriousness of the conversation um, would be Jones Road Beauty, <laughs> and, uh, um, which is, but here's why it makes me sad. So Jones Road Beauty is the, is the uh, beauty cosmetics company launched by Emerson alum, Bobby Brown, uh, literally on the day her non-compete expired after she sold uh, you know, that was put in place after she sold her original namesake beauty brand. Um, but what really has made me smile about this brand is not only do I love the products, which I do, um, she is doing a lot of what I'm talking about here, which she is, she is fundamentally trying to change how w women in general, but particularly women of a certain age, kind of really interact with their own faces. Because <laughs> um, her whole philosophy, which has been consistent through her whole career, which is part of the reason why I've long been, you know, as much of a Bobby Brown fan, the woman, um, as I have been of, of Diane Bob Furstenberg, um, there has been this absolute through line, this red thread of playing up what you got, making the best of that. Um, and, and presuming strength and beauty from what's already present. And so I've just really loved that. I mean, I, you know, anytime that I'm given a chance to just say, you know, Hey, this is, this is an amazing brand. <laughs> they don't pay me anything to say this. I mean, I just love it. Um, it's just been fun to, you know, as a 50 year old woman to frankly, to be able to play with makeup again and play with makeup that feels like it's the right kind of makeup for where I am in my life, you know? Um, you know, fun story, you know, once women get to a certain age, sometimes they have something that's known as melasma, which is a kind of darker pigmentation that just shows up randomly and splotches on the face. <laughs> Thanks, age. Um, and I went to a dermatologist to see what I could do for it. I don't go to this dermatologist anymore. Let me say this. And he was like, well, you know, they've got makeup for that. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, you did not just say that to me. <laughs> um, I'm like, all right, no. You know, and what I appreciate about, about Jones Road is just really about saying, yeah, so you got melasma? So what? You know, like, you, whatever. It's part of your face. Um, and I just really appreciate that. So it, it is a – that brand makes me smile because it, like DVF, to me is a brand so consistently – in alignment with its, like, you know, in adult learning, we talk about the difference between what are espoused values and what are values in use. Um, and I don't see much of a gap, if any gap, in in either brand. And that's that's one of those things that just, again, uh, it, it just, it resonates very strongly with me uh, to get to that point, because to bring it back to marketing and branding, I have a long thought that that is the most powerful position that any of us can adopt is just articulate what you already have uh, in the best possible way um, rather than try to stretch out to something that that doesn't feel comfortable just because somebody else says you should or because that's where you know the pundits say that the market is what you've got is not only enough it's powerful so let's build from there and that's one of the reasons why I really love Jones Road I love it all right well where can folks go to learn more about who you are and what you do? Oh, super. Yes. Well, uh, me specifically, I all things me are at TamsinWebster.com. Uh, and I should say, but where I am putting all of my effort and focus, et cetera, these days is at MessageDesignInstitute.com, which will be launching, depending on when this comes out, Mid-September. I'm just going to say mid-September. Um, or has launched. <laughs> um, because what I really believe is that A, persuasive message design, uh, the, the label I put on this 
what I do, another word for change communications, um, I believe is a core life and business skill. And I think to this point, there's been you know, there's just been this belief that this, it's a it's a it's some kind of gift handed down from the gods, and I was, and I'm like, no, uh, this is a transferable skill. This is a skill that anybody not only you know needs to learn but can learn, and so that's what the Message Design Institute is going to be all about. So it's democratizing this really important skill for making change happen. Well, that is great. We will link up to all of that in our show notes, which folks can always find at onbrandpodcast.com. Tamsin Webster, thanks for being on brand with us. Ah, a delight as always. On Brand is part of the Marketing Podcast Network. If you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, you can always listen free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite platform may be. And please take a moment and rate and review the podcast to help others find the show. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.